Hello, hello. Hey, I'm going to be here. Joan's going to be showing up here shortly. Apologize. I, I sent her the wrong link a few minutes ago, and so I just sent her the right link. So hopefully she gets that in time and isn't waiting in the other room. So um, welcome, welcome everyone to our 20 must-haves for recovery from processed food addiction. Uh, again, just hanging out here, entertaining you all as we wait for our guest. Again, that's my fault. I sent her the wrong link. And so um, let me know if you're here. Well, I wish I had the, the Jeopardy music here to, to play for you all here. Ding, 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 ding. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So again, we're hanging out, hanging out, just waiting. Um, um, There she is. She's coming. She's coming. Hi, Joan. I'm so sorry. Uh, can you hear me okay, Joan? Hi there. Hello. I'm so sorry. My uh, my primary assistant quit a couple weeks ago and um, no worries. I sent you the wrong link because there was, yeah, anyway, so I'm so glad you're here. Yay. Welcome. Yay. I'm so glad to see you. <laughs> How I are miss you? our dinner so much. Yeah. Yes. Oh, hopefully by next year we'll be able to get get back together again and see each other at conferences and things like that. But so. you're not but you're not in Seattle anymore. Nope. Uh moved to Phoenix uh nine months ago. So yeah. I had to get some sun and some heat. So it's uh but you know, I'll still be going to you know, probably next year I think is when the conferences may be resuming. So I'll still I'll still be uh I'll see, I'll see at those things. And plus my son's still up in Seattle. So I'll be, I'll be back up in Seattle several times a year. So. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, let us know when you're coming. Okay. For sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. the end of August for sure. So uh, <laughs> that'll be the next time. That's five months away though. All um, right. Well, today you have for us the 20 must haves for recovery from processed yes. food addiction. Yeah. Um, very excited to talk about this. Um, just to start with Joan, will you give, so, so we may have some people popping in live, but also this will be, um, it's going to be a recording that our, uh, members can watch at a later time as well. So we may have, we, we may or may not have actual live questions here. Um, and then also it's going to be eventually, um, an interview that's going to be up on my YouTube, uh, channel for the right. public eventually. So just so you have some context right. of who's going to be watching this here. So, um, so just you, to start, oh, go ahead. Do you want to use slides or do you want me to just speak? Oh, if you can do slides, yeah. Let that's if you've got that. Um, Let me just double check here uh, on the. Does it allow uh, you to do that or? Um, Let me just double check that I've got the right ones. I don't. Yeah. I might not have the right ones. And I don't know if only I can or if it's going to let you share them. Uh, on this side. Oh, like I might have to send them to you. Okay, that's all right. Let me let me just find them first. Okay. Oh, we might have and I might have somebody watching uh Kristen, if you're there, I got your message here that you were looking for it. So I think you found it. So Kristen, if you're there, um, if you comment, um, I'll get an email notification because there are several different places people can be watching. So uh, Kristen, if you comment, let us know you're there. I will get an email notification. So I'll keep an eye on my emails. So if you have any questions for Joan, um, please go ahead and uh, uh, type your, your comments or questions below where you're watching it there. Um, and when you're ready, Joan, I would just love to start with just sharing a little bit of your background and um, your your training and just so to give some people context of why you're an expert at what you do. Okay. All right. I do have slides and I can send you the link to the slides or you can tell me that I can share them. Yeah, I don't know that I can let you do that, but if you send me the email, I'll, I can I okay. get your, uh, your, okay. your, your technical, what is that, the... Uh, audio visual the av tech for you <laughs> okay okay um 
So I am going over to email. I'm going to hit the return. And here's the link to the slides. All right, it is sent. All right, let's refresh and see if we can. Might take a minute through the internet land. <laughs> yes, it's a big file. It's, there it's it is. There it is. Excellent. Um, and is your bio in here or? No, no. Not? I'll just. I can give you. Uh, if you if you want if you want to introduce me, I can send you a bio or. Well, let's just, just have you. Yeah, we're already live, so let's just have you share. Um, okay. Your your uh, your background with us, please. Super. Hi, everybody. I am Dr. Joan F. Land. Um, my PhD is in addictive nutrition, of all things. Uh, there are only two of us in the world. Uh, I really started out in this field at conception. I mean, I was. I'm the daughter of two people who were using processed foods among uh, alcohol and nicotine and caffeine, and I was born addicted. Uh, we know that cells are replicating in an addictive fashion. So from the moment of conception, I started struggling with food. Um, I had cravings as a child, really intense cravings, which research shows us uh, children have more intense cravings than adults, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't really develop a weight problem until I'd had my two children. Um, I was 31 and 32 when I had those two kids. And then I started yo-yo dieting and getting sick and sicker and sicker. I had a really prestigious degree. I have an undergraduate degree in economics and political science from Oberlin College. And I have an MBA from Stanford. And I worked in the corporate world for five years before I had my kids. And I was too sick to go back to work. Mm. I was constantly sneezing, constant sinus infections, running eyes, red eyes, just disgusting. <laughs> and I was yo-yo dieting. So because of the back-to-back -back pregnancies and just eating too much and not exactly the right things, I developed a more severe food addiction. I can trace food addiction by the diagnostic criteria for adults to my childhood. I was severely addicted as a small child. Mm. I had the symptoms, I had the signs, and uh, it, but it really accelerated through my pregnancies. Mm. So I was also suffering from a rotten personality I was raging and angry and irritable and critical. I was not nice to be around and I didn't want to be. So I was doing therapy and I did a women's group and I did a 12 step group and none of it was helping. I would just erupt in these rages and then be just so ashamed of myself afterwards mm -hmm. but I couldn't help it. It was just, it would just come from my feet and out my mouth before I could stop it. Well, finally, somebody in one of the support groups asked me if I might consider joining a group called Food Addicts in Recovery. Mm. And I said, why? You know, I was kind of at a thin phase. And she said, she could hear the sugar in my uh, running my behavior. Mm. She could hear the sugar running the rage. So I tried it and the miracle really started January 1st, 1996. I made my first clean meals. Uh, I was sure it wouldn't work because there's way too much food there. But by Thursday, I knew that something huge was happening. Mm. Cravings stopped. I didn't know I had cravings because I'd never not had them. Mm. <clears throat> the fatigue stopped. The brain, stopped, brain fog stopped. And then I'd lost two pounds by the end of the week, mm. eating all this food, not being hungry. It's just like, what? That, that, that doesn't happen. So uh, the allergies started clearing up and the sinus constant lifelong sinus infection cleared up. And then in the third week, I realized I hadn't yelled at anybody in three weeks. Oh. 
And that was the moment in which I really started on this career. So I wrote a book about it. It took me three years to write a book about how do you do a clean food plan in this culture. And then I tried getting on TV and that worked and the book did well. And uh, I just kept thinking, I, I, the only problem is people don't know about this. So mm. that was my first major mistake. That's not what is required to get off of processed foods. Um, and then a TV producer wouldn't let me come on their big national talk show because I didn't have a degree in my field. So I went back, I went back to Union Institute, which is a school for new fields and earned my PhD in three years and came out and said, okay, well now I'm gonna write articles and teach the teachers and that didn't work. I mean, it just like, I didn't fully know what it meant to have a severe addiction. Mm, you cannot yeah. teach a severe addict, a severely addicted person. You can't teach them out of an addiction. Mm. But I kept trying, you know, um, I started a prepared meal company. It was just like saying to somebody, a severe alcoholic, look, I'm going to tell you about water. I'm going to make sure you have plenty of water. And it's really wonderful water. And you're going to feel so much better after you start using water in place of the alcohol. That was how naive that approach is. You can't just give somebody who has these really severe brain alterations uh, information or availability. It's not enough. I love so, that analogy. That's so funny. <laughs> I went, uh, and then my dad died in 2014 and CRC Press came along hmm. and they said, would you write the textbook for us? And I knew I needed to go back to Cincinnati where I grew up uh, to make sure that my stepmom got through the end of her life was okay. And uh, it just coincided with this textbook. And my dad left me enough money that I could support myself. And I spent the next three years writing the textbook. Mm. This is 240,000 words. It's got 2,000 citations, which means it's really built from the research. Well, in the course of writing the textbook came two major, major breakthroughs. One is we're typically severely addicted. Mm. So the American Psychiatric Association publishes addic addiction diagnostic criteria, and there are 11 of them. And if you have, if you're experiencing six or more, you have a severe case. And I wrote a chapter on each one of those 11 criteria so people could see how the addiction appeared in overeating. And I got to the end of chapter six and I, chapter one, well, everybody's got that. Chapter two, everybody's got that. Chapter three, chapter four, chapter five, chapter six. Oh my goodness. This is a severe addiction. And the other thing that came out of the textbook, well, and that's, that explained why nothing I had done to that point had worked. Mm. I needed a reliable method to get people off these addictive substances, the sugars and flowers and dairy, et cetera, and stay off them for a lifetime because you don't want to put them back. They're toxic. Mm. And then um, the other really big epiphany is that people are typically deeply traumatized. Mm when they come into this. Uh, if they were heavy as children, they were they could have been rejected by their parents. If they were using as children, they never developed any life skills because they would just reach for the food. Mm -hmm. uh, if they were in relationships, 30% uh, of obese people are being physically abused. The health system unknowingly abuses them, like surgery for an addiction. What? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Uh, pharmaceuticals that leave you with heart disease? No. And uh, residential stays that are quite traumatic because they're digging around in your past without cleaning up your food? No. I mean, so we've really endured a lot of trauma, plus the bullying, typical bullying and uh, traumatizing that goes on around people with a particular body shape. And that was the other big piece. So, um, Three years ago, I mean, just as soon as I turned in the manuscript, I started uh, developing teaching materials 
and a daily phone call, a daily phone call was not enough. Mm -hmm. This is a severe addiction. It means you either go for residential treatment for two years. And we have hundreds of millions of people who are addicted. That is not going to happen. The next level of treatment is intensive outpatient where you go to the hospital uh, five days a week from like nine to four. And we're, you know, we don't have the facilities for that either. Plus a lot of the worst cases are immobile. People, they're, they're, the addiction has eroded their bones and joints mm -hmm. and they're in wheelchairs or it's given them such deep depression that they, that they really can't leave their house or their body shape attracts uh, traumatizing bullying and uh, stigmatization. Mm. And they just don't wanna leave their house anymore. Mm. So what we did figure out is that we could bring recovery to them in their homes via Zoom. And my first Zoom meeting in December of 2017, I just thought, oh, this is it. And then we had our first week long program on Zoom the first week of January, 2017. And for the first time in 22 years, everybody was eating clean mm. by the end of the first day. And they were as shocked as I was. You know, I've been trying to get a clean day in for 20 years. Today I did it, which led to all the knowledge and discovery of mirror neurons, conformance drive, uh, social circle adaptation, and that's what we captured. That's how the food industry got us addicted in the first place, and that's what we have turned around to use for our own good, is this conformance drive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here I am. We are three three years into the arc of the Addiction Reset community. Uh, we've, we've just, we counted up last year, we made 20 innovations in how the ARC works. We're still adding, growing, strengthening. And uh, now after 25 years, I have a reliable method. Ah, oh, that's great. I love it. That's exciting. You 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 know uh, there was a problem and then you've worked to come up with a solution. So I love it. 25 years later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, it takes time. It's, yeah. Yeah. I can see we've got three people watching. I can't see who you are until you comment, though. So go ahead and, you know, give us a little comment. Let, let us know you're here. And uh, this is meant to be interactive for the people that are here live. Um, let us give us a comment. Let us know you're here. Any questions you've got for Joan, go ahead and just comment as we go along, too. So, uh, Joan, are you ready to switch over to the, the, sure. the slides now? Okay. You'll have sure. to let me know when you're ready to, since I'm, um, I'll, uh, let's see. I think I can do, let's see. I do that. Oops, sorry. There we go. I think we'll do it that way. How's that? Because I think if I go this, I don't know how it looks on your side because then I can't see anything. So anyways, hopefully that's okay just doing it that way. So let me know when you're ready for the next slide. <laughs> okay. So today we're going to talk about... Um, what does it take to get off of these very, very addictive substances? What does it take to recover from a severe addiction? This is severe because it starts in early childhood. No other addiction has ever started in early childhood. Mm. And it involves a lot of different substances, sugars and flour and gluten and dairy and excessive salt and processed fats and caffeine and food additives are all addictive, very addictive. Sugar is more addictive than cocaine. So this is a severe addiction and this is why nobody recovers from overeating. They lose the weight and then they gain it back and they lose it and they gain it back and it gets worse and worse over time. Well, it's because uh, if that happened to you, it's because you needed a different program. And these are the must-haves. I call them the must-haves that need to be present in your program. And we're just gonna whip through them so we have plenty of time for questions. And uh, you will see why. Why do you have to have this in your program? Mm. All right, Carol, let's do this. All right, and we've got, uh, Rita has commented that she's watching. So welcome Rita, glad you're here. Thank you, Rita. 
So if you have the right support, you can have success. If you've never had success at controlling your weight, controlling your eating, being at peace with your food, it's because you've been in the wrong program. Programs are generally incomplete and inadequate. So we're gonna go through what, what constitutes a complete program. Is that a cue for next or? <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll, I'll give you a next. Okay, oh, okay, okay. I'll go back. <laughs> okay. Next. I'm going to read your mind. Next. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So we divided these into five categories. You have to have knowledge of the research. You have to have knowledge and experience with meal management, with lapse management, with meeting stress. A lot of support group meetings are stressful, which is tr actually triggering the addiction. Mm -hmm. And you have to have the right leadership and resources. Next. So when I talk about uh, knowledge of research, I need, uh, it's got to be the basis of the guidance that's given. Uh, it's got to include information about how big tobacco came into processed foods. It's got to include how conformance drive works. And then it's got to be for a lifetime. Next. So if you're, if you're, support is based on research, then you are getting advice that's going to work. The problem with a lot of problems is they are based on one individual's experience mm. and the probability that that one individual's experience is going to be a match for what you need is zero. Mm. You need the studies that show a, a big population tended in this direction. So when I give you advice based on that study, it is much more likely to work. I mean, my personal experience is not going to be a match for what you need. So then you're more likely to actually use the experience uh, and use the advice because you come to see that it starts to work. So you're more motivated to make changes. Yeah, next. And this piece, uh, your program has got to recognize the role of big tobacco, the role of corporations in deliberately creating the addiction. Otherwise, you don't know how to defend against that. They use very specific techniques and you need very specific skills in order to counteract and defend against those techniques. Plus, they caused this. We have the evidence uh, in documents that they submitted in their court proceedings they deliberately went after creating addiction in children. And so if you don't have this piece, you're going to blame yourself. And then you're going to be looking in the wrong direction. If you blame yourself, you're going to be looking at childhood issues and uh, just therapy and things like that. This is a straight up very bad addiction. And it needs very specific addiction related actions. And if you don't, if you continue to blame yourself, you're not going to take those actions. This is essential that big tobacco, the role of big tobacco be recognized in your program. Next. And, and conformance drive engagement. We know from the research that the teaching, the learning, the memory part of the brain is not working in an addiction. And so you've got to go to a different system in the brain, which is conformance drive engagement. You have a, a really strong conformance drive from 7 million years of human evolution, when if you were conforming to a small group of people, seven to 12 people, you would live because you would find food, find shelter, your children would be protected and predators would be fought off. If you didn't have conformance drive, and you were not sticking with your troop, if you were wandering off, well, the giant hyenas were waiting for you for lunch and you would not live long enough to, to send on your genes. So because the addiction is really occupying the brain, you have to rely on this very powerful, primitive survival instinct, which is I'm going to do what I see people doing. And that means that you have to have enough 
frequency of meetings through the day, 365 days a year, to actually identify mm. with that troop. Mm. Okay, so you can't, and it's very hard to maintain any progress you're making if everybody you see is eating processed foods. Your conformance tribe is then gonna pull you in the wrong direction. All right, next. Mm. The program has to be for a lifetime because of that, you know, the conformance drive is a double-edged sword. If you're around healthy people, it's your it's your saving grace. But if you're around unhealthy people, it will kill you. So you need to be around healthy people for a lifetime, which means your program has got to be affordable. It's got to be easily accessed, accessed and uh, it's just got to become a very gently woven into the fabric of your life so that it becomes normal. All right, next. Now, meal management, this is not easy. And if you're in a program that expects you somehow by magic or miracle to have meal management skills on day one, like you're not allowed to talk until your meals are somebody else's weird idea perfect, um, then you're in the wrong program. So what you need is very slow skill management development. You need to be free of judgment. You need to definitely be around people who are not judging what you're eating. You need to not be required to eat specific foods and you need to have a broad vision of your victories. So let's run through those next. Uh, you need lots of times to organize your food. Uh, and this is very traumatic to be giving up such a long list of foods. It might take a couple of years before you are really comfortable with giving up the next food, giving up the next food, giving up the next food. And if you're under pressure to do that and somebody is telling you that you have to do that or you're a bad person or you're not a member of the in crowd or you can't speak uh, before you have done this list, you're in, a, you're in the wrong program. They are, they're judging you. Um, and we have been so traumatized by diets. If we're pressured to do something like this too quickly, you will trigger the trauma of dieting. The trauma of dieting is you don't have enough food. You're waking up the food seeking part of your brain, uh, which is going to protect you from dying of starvation. So you need lots of slow time to get your food organized. It's, it's a must have. If you're being pressured to do things too quickly or you're being judged because you haven't done things, you're in the wrong program and the program is hurting you. All right, next. And uh, if you're in a program that doesn't let you talk or ostracizes you or keeps you on the periphery because of something that you have eaten, that program is stressing you out and it's actually making the addiction worse. So people lapse. And if you're in a program that understands that and lifts you up, you're okay. You can just keep building and keep making progress. But if you're in a program that says, oh, you're a failure, uh, that's not true. Lapsing is normal. We've got that in the research. And they are, it's something called gaslighting. They're trying to get you to believe something that's not true. And of course that then translates into, uh, I'm a failure, I hate myself, I quit. Uh, when you need to be in there for the very long haul. Yeah, okay, Carol. Can I ask a question here? Um, how do you uh, balance lapses are normal, but also you shouldn't lapse? Like yes, <laughs> yes, this is a super excellent question. You take the judgment out of the equation entirely and you go straight from lapse to pain. So lapse is hurt. You know, you have a headache and your stomach hurts and you're tired and you're crabby and you know, the, the, everything gets inflamed and the, the, your joints hurt and your feet hurt and a lapse is hurt. But when you are focused on somebody else who's judging you for it, you, you have the additional pain of the shame and then you wanna go into isolation, then you wanna hide, then you wanna quit the program, anything so that you don't have to face the pain. 
But if you come in and you have lapsed and you get compassion for it, that just makes you compassionate towards yourself. Oh, and what I say when people come in and they've lapsed, I said, this is really hard. What you're doing is really hard. But we are, we're gonna to come to a slide about cueing. And usually when people have lapsed, they already know what happened. They already know that they were exposed to too much stimulation of stress, relationship, food, whatever, and it ignited. It set on fire the addicted brain cells. So well, we just say, we say, I'm sorry that happened. Uh, I know this is painful. Uh, you might not feel well for four days, but we will be there with you. That makes you not want to lapse again. Okay, this is painful. And then you can get the, the correct associative cueing. So you look at the food and you feel the pain. You look at the food, you feel the pain. You look at the food, you feel the pain. After a while, you develop something called natural aversion. But if you look at the food and you feel shame, you're gonna try to eat to allevi alleviate the pain of the shame. Mm. See, you've got, it, you've, got, you've got a triangle, got a detour there that is keeping you in the lapse. Mm. Yeah. Love it. And this is, this is along the lines of like, that's actually a hypnotic process in the brain is if you associate that addictive food sub substance with the pain, yeah, that will actually be what makes you averse to it, which is what you yeah. said. Whereas if you, so this is where people always get stuck, right? Because they, they uh -huh. turn to food for comfort and then they feel mm -hmm. bad about what they ate and then they want to eat more of that. So yes. Okay. Yes. So, and the shame um, will keep you in the laps. Yeah. The shame will keep you in the laps. But if you associate it with like, oh my gosh, my feet are going to hurt like heck, then you will avoid. Then you'll, then you'll get out of it. This is actually one of the most powerful recovery tools out there, this index card. <laughs> because you can put the name of the tempting food on one side and you can put all the, all the different kinds of pain on the other side. Okay. And then you can just, you can use it like a vocabulary card. Uh, when I see this food, I want to think about the pain in my, in my joints, or I want to think about the headache, or I want to think about screaming at my kids, mm. all of which are painful consequences of a lapse. So you can train, this is Pavlovian conditioning of brain cells, same technique you would learn, you would use to learn a foreign language. Are you yeah. guys getting this? This is so, I love this. Okay, everyone watching this, your foods that you struggle with, this is so powerful. This tech, you know, post-it note, an index card, whatever you've got, the foods that you feel the most like you're missing out on or that call your name the most, write them on a card and then write all the pain on the other side. Oh, I love uh -huh. this. So Associative great. queuing. Yep. Yeah. Great. All right. Let's do another one. This is so good, Carol. <laughs> I think this is the one we, you haven't talked about this one yet. Nope, this is, um, you're not what you've eaten. It's okay. if, you've had, if you've had a lapse, okay. you're still a wonderful person. Yeah, and this is so important. I, this just makes me crazy when I hear about programs that require people to eat food that they're allergic to or that they just don't like. Mm. If you are in that program, move on. Those mm -hmm. people don't understand what's going on with you. Yeah, I, it's just astonishing. Yeah, all right, let's do another one. And then all kinds of victories are celebrated. This is something else that is so short-sighted. There are plenty of groups out there that only celebrate abstinence and body shape. Well, there are 141 diseases associated with processed foods, mm. according to Nancy Appleton, who actually keeps track of this. Uh, she's got a study, 141 studies linking processed foods to various degrees. So I know from 25 years of experience that body shape and abstinence are not enough of a motivation to keep you Mm -hmm. from picking up something. It's just not. But if you know it's cancer and diabetes, amputations, kidney failure, blindness, stroke, paralysis, if you know that it's irritability and depression, 
and anxiety and chemically induced shame. If you know it's Alzheimer's, if you're headed towards dementia, which processed foods contribute to. Mm -hmm. If you know that your attention deficit and your learning disorder and your inability to make decisions and your memory loss and your poor impulse control are all chemically driven by processed foods. If you know your joint pain and your fatigue and your brain fog are all related to processed foods and you, and you have it firmly associated in your head, gosh, you're not gonna pick it up. We're getting Your motivation a, is just so much greater. We're getting a big, yes. I think this is from Kristen, so yeah. Yeah. All right. What's next? So lapse prevention and rebound. This is so crucial. I don't know of any other program, maybe Carol's got this going on, that treats lapses accurately, appropriately. They're all, they all think lapsing is a failure. It is not a failure. So we have to, you have to be in a program that has correct expectations. You have to be in a program that's going to teach you cue management because cues are the reason we lapse. And um, you have to just stop, stop, stop. Be, be really, the skill of not blaming yourself has to be taught. All right, Carol, let's look at this. I've already got two pages of notes already, so good. <laughs> <laughs> but, you, but you'll keep the slides, keep the slides. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, your program must recognize it takes years for lapses to stop. We have a tremendous researcher at Harvard. His name is John F. Kelly. This has been his life work to show what is the, uh, the reasonable course of recovery from an addiction five years for drug and alcohol addiction, mm -hmm. for the uh, drug or alcohol addicted person to stop lapsing, five years. And ours is much, much more deeply embedded because it starts in childhood and so many mm -hmm. different substances. It's so heavily triggered by the processed food industry. Our social circles are all eating it, blah, blah, blah. So you might never stop lapsing. And there's these substances are hidden in food. You go to a restaurant, they claim they make claims about the food, they're not accurate. You walk out of there, your joints hurt, you know that they lied about what's in the food or they just don't know. And um, that's a lapse. It's not an intentional lapse, but, you, but your program needs to train you in how to recover from that. We live in a treacherous culture. So if you're in a program where, you know, you're, you're gonna get traumatized over a lapse. Like there are programs that fire people mm. if they have a lapse. That is 180 degrees the wrong direction. You need tremendous compassion, reassurance, and encouragement. No, a lapse is not the end of the world. Just think of it like a skinned knee. Yeah, it hurts like heck. Um, but now you know where you tripped, you know, to get your skinned knee. And you're going to be uh, just a little bit more careful the next time you walk that path. You know where that tree root is now. You're not going to trip over it. And you're not going to skin your knee again uh, because of that training, 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 training in how to view a lapse compassionately. I'm sorry that happened. It really hurts. I'm sorry you have this addiction. You didn't ask for it. I'm sorry nobody controls the, the tobacco industry all dressed up like processed foods. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But you're smarter now. You know, we when in our program, there are no failures. You either learn or you win. And learning is a win. So you win-win all the time. You're stronger, you're smarter, you're more experienced, you're more motivated, you're clearer about what happened. You, that person needs a tremendous amount of encouragement to come to pop out of the laps and keep building. That's the way to 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 mm -hmm. handle a lapse. If your program doesn't handle lapse, if you have to take a new chip and get in front of the room and confess and sit in the back of the room for 90 days, you can't talk. If you're being punished and humiliated for lapses, your program is traumatizing you. Mm -hmm. All right, next. 
training and queue management. So this just tears me up inside. These programs, which are humiliating people, are relapsing, but they're not teaching them how to avoid the lapse in the first place. Lapses are cued. Lapses are stimulated. You have these highly sensitized, addictive brain cells in your reward system. That's all that's wrong. And the food industry is incredibly good at provoking them, stimulating them, until they release enough neurochemicals to control your behavior. And then like a robot or a zombie, you're walking over to get something while your frontal lobe is screaming, no, no, no. No, no, no is not strong enough to overcome addicted brain cells. So got to back it up and teach people how to avoid the stimulation. I'll just insert here, like this is a, this is a problem we've got right now in the, in the keto world is because the food manufacturers are starting to make all these keto treat foods and they're using the same techniques that got you hooked on all your former carber, carby non-keto foods that you used to eat. And with the fantasy of like, well, but can I just have a bar, a shake, a, you know, a snack food, these, these things again, because they're keto. But as, as I've worked through with a lot of you, like it can cue the exact same yeah. cravings and food obsession and overeating. And uh, so, you know, Slim Fast coming out with their keto dessert things is uh, not because they're trying to do you any favors. They're trying to get you to buy their products and overeat. So, yeah, yeah. These are very deeply embedded uh, memories of using these addictive foods. If you're eating something that's keto formulated, but it looks like mm -hmm. uh, um, a candy, for example, your brain is going to react to it like a, like it's candy. Yeah, I had one of my clients that early on, she was still like, so one of my rules for people to start out is stop looking at pictures of food and food videos. Yes, times. thank you, and, that's yeah. key management, yeah. Yes, yes, and uh, so she was still following certain people on Instagram and saw some picture of a, um, I, I try to avoid like specific names of food. So I just, you know, uh, a, a keto version recipe for a carby food, like a pseudo uh, carby food, right? Effectively. Yeah. And so she, and so basically she didn't even recognize the pattern of what had happened. She just told me, I don't know what happened. I was in the grocery store craving this, this carby yes. food. And yeah. I feel really good because I found like a, a frozen version of this that was a keto version, even though it really wasn't, you know, it was, wasn't was really on program, right? So um, she, so we traced it back. I was like, so where did you start to crave this food? You know, were you looking at photos of this? And she says, oh, oh my gosh, fine. you're right. I was following, I was looking at Instagram photos and somebody posted a recipe of this type of food. And yeah. the brain can't tell the difference. It looks like the regular car carby version. Your brain doesn't go, oh, wait, that's the keto version. It's no. different than the former one. So no. it can't tell the difference. So, <laughs> Carol, that was brilliant. That was brilliant. Yes. I, we recommend, and people will do it. They just, now they want to do it. Just get out of all those food groups. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I'm no, following at pictures of food, yeah. I, I still to this day, like I used to love to watch cooking shows and to this day I, I can't because no, no. as soon as I start to watch it, I start to get really hungry and it's just like, nope, it's yeah. just easier not to get in a place of craving than it is to try to resist the craving. So you, you don't want any kind of excitement. Yeah. <laughs> no excitement. No excitement. No, that's just, that's deadly. Yeah. All right. Uh, and re the, the release from self-blame is crucial. When you really get, uh, remember our very first must-have is it must be based in research. Research shows us exactly what the brain does when it's been addicted by these corporations. And when it's then stimulated, uh, it pulls the blood flow away from the frontal lobe where your braking system is, where your rational thought is, those, those brain cells stop firing. And the only brain cells that are firing are either your stress brain cells or your addicted brain cells 
or your food seeking brain cells because they've been activated by dieting and not in not enough food so when you when your brain is in that condition you don't have control it's just it's just the control is up here in this little teeny tiny two percent of the brain frontal lobe and yet everybody teaches us oh well you should have control you should have willpower just push away from the table that is totally ridiculous in an addicted brain you need years of training to keep those addicted brain cells calm keep the stress brain cells calm uh, keep your frontal lobe really, really active and keep those food seeking brain cells calm. Mm. Uh, that takes a lot of brain conditioning. Mm. And until you have that, there's no way you can stop lapsing. Mm. Yeah. All right. So no more self blame. Okay. Yes. Grace. Give yourself grace. Indeed. All right, the meetings have to be uh, very specifically structured. According to research, they have to be online. They have to be very frequent. They have to cover the weekends. You have to be able to reach somebody between meetings. You have to be able to talk in the meetings, no matter what. And you need, um, you need to be able to control when you go to the meetings. Okay. So why do the meetings have to be online? It's because you need to get to them frequently. You are going to, your, your conformance drive will just latch on to whatever is most frequent. So it will latch on to the people it sees the most. That is just how conformance drive works. Mm -hmm. If it only sees people in your household who eat processed foods all the time, or people at work who eat processed foods, or eating disordered actors and actresses on TV, stressful programming, then it is not going to let you give up the processed foods. Your conformance drive controls everything. I know that sounds over the top, but it is true. So if you are in a meeting a lot of the day, or you're listening to programming from your tribe, uh, then your conformance drive will helplessly soop, switch over. It's, just, it's got radar going on all the time. Who's here? Who's here? Who's here? What are they doing? Should we copy them? No, they're not in our tribe. You've got to get them to the point where should we copy them? Yes, we see them all the time. They're our tribe. They're our social circle. They're our community, and we need to fit in if we are going to live. You cannot do that in the physical world, but the amazing thing is you can do it in the virtual world. Mm. Yeah. yeah, so for those of you, uh, you know, crew members here, uh, play the recordings of the, yes. the meetings, like have them going in the background. That's, yes. and that's you, use like you, you've said, like use the power of like what the food manufacturers do is put those commercials so that they're pro constantly programming us. Uh, you all have the power to, have your own commercials for your keto group, like have those playing in yes. the background or listen to them frequently. Yes, that is how you do it. That is exactly how you do it. And Carol, you probably have presenters whom you like. Uh, you can play those presenter interviews. Uh, if, you, if you have people, you know, that are on your page, uh, play their interviews. Yeah, Just yeah. Constant reinforcement, this is, Messaging, messaging, messaging. Yeah. All right. Let's go on. Uh, they have to have the meetings have to happen frequently through the day because stress is a major trigger. If you can get into a meeting and talk through the stressful event, it takes the power out of it. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. You're you're replacing a, in the mechanics is you're replacing a dopamine deficit with an oxytocin rush. The oxytocin is released in community. And uh, when you have oxytocin running through your system, you don't need the dopamine and serotonin from the processed foods. Mm. It, it will take away the power of a, of a stressful event to get you to lapse. Mm. So they've got to happen like, uh, you know, our meetings happen every couple of hours. And... Um, but like Carol says, you can play a recording of a meeting and that will induce 
the, the, only the frontal lobe in the brain understands screens. The other 98% of the brain just thinks if it's seeing a person, the person is there. Mm -hmm. Screens are unbelievably effective, which is why you really have to carefully manage what you're exposing your brain to on a screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, next. So weekends and holidays, it's got to be 365 days a year. Um, but if, if you've got an archive of meetings, of course, you can access that archive of recorded meetings on weekends and holidays. The queuing changes on weekends and holidays, the routines and the, the queue response routines that you've set up through the week typically fall apart on the weekends and holidays. So you need reinforcement 365 days a year. Okay, and and make sure that there's somebody kind of like on call between meetings. Yeah. Uh, we're using private messenger groups for this mm. function. Um, we're putting seven to 12 members in a private messenger group with a trained person uh, so that uh, I can get into a private messenger group. And we're organizing those by time zones. So somebody's likely to be awake. So you all have your personal peer mentor that you can reach out to at any time. And also those, some of you are in pods. So we've got them, are, for us they're optional, but similar thing, either text or messenger based um, that's led by one of our peer mentors as well. So you all have those two options for immediate outreach, so. Brilliant, brilliant. Carol, I am so glad you're doing that. You can save yourself from a painful lapse. Mm -hmm. if you can just get in a pod, somebody's awake in there, or we have like a private Facebook group is another place to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't believe this. My husband just told me that um, blah, 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 something awful. And five people come back and say, oh, I'm so sorry that happened. Uh, but we believe in you, we see you, we see how wonderful you are. Do you remember the other day you did this thing mm -hmm. and it was so cool? just pull them out of their stress brain and back into the security of their recovery brain through mm -hmm. stimulation, through reminders. Brain management is very cool once you get the hang of it. It's mm -hmm. you just make sure that you have safe stimulation. You have a recording or you have a private messenger group mm -hmm. that you can always stimulate the recovery part of the brain back into action, back into releasing the most neurochemicals in the brain, back into control. And with modern technology, it's, it's really doable. Mm. All right, Carol, next. Uh, this is something that just makes me crazy when in a lot of groups, if you lapse, you can't speak for, for 90 days. Mm. Oh, wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, so Oh, of, that's, mm. yeah. Uh, well, wouldn't that just encourage lying then, right? Like, wouldn't oh, totally. that just, yeah, totally, yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. You can't speak in a meeting. You could speak to people outside of the meeting, but you can't speak up in a meeting. And so you don't have access to that group support and that group encouragement and the group compassion, which is incredibly powerful. So a must have is you must be able to speak no matter what the heck you've eaten. It just makes me crazy. Mm. All right, what else do we have? You know, the time commitment. Uh, once you tell somebody they have to do something, it immediately creates a stress response, which activates the addiction. So we have a big role. There are things that we don't talk about in our meetings. We don't talk about religion, sex, politics, medications, um, medical procedures, body shape, or, or specific foods because we don't want to trigger anybody and we don't want to divide the community. Uh, but other than that, uh, you, uh, you, there, you don't have to do anything. You can come to a meeting and not talk. You can come to a meeting and talk. <laughs> you can come to a meeting and turn off your camera or turn on your camera. Uh, you can come to a conference call and you mute your microphone you, the, the individual member has to have control over the pace and depth of engagement because that is, that's just cruel to say you have to. You have to call these three people today. You know, well, what if they've been traumatized and, mm -hmm. and they're isolating because they've been traumatized? 
forcing somebody to talk to another person could make them quit mm. and justifiably so i'm not ready to do that don't ever do anything until you're ready the little voice in the back of your head your head says i think i'd like to try that mm. that keeps you calm and that keeps the stress at bay and you've got the stress activates lapsing mm. so um You've, you've got to be in a group that gives you control over how you interface with the group. Mm. All right, Carol, let's see if we have another one. Oh, we have a bunch. Okay, let me go through these pretty quick. Mm -hmm. Let's just whip these, Carol, because I'd like to give people time for questions. Okay. Go ahead. Leadership and resources. The leaderships have to be, the leader has to be trained. They have to be trained in the research. They have to be trained in the very particular language of compassion. Uh, because that is what's going to lift you up time and again as the addiction trips you up. All right, next. Uh, the, and the leaders have to be focused on your strengths. You have to be talking all the time about your strengths. Mm. Oh my goodness, your resilience is terrific. Oh my goodness, you are so strong. And and keep the milestones in mind. You know, two weeks you wouldn't have been able to. Two weeks ago you wouldn't have been able to walk through that, but today you walk through. You walk straight through it. And you came out without lapsing that just constant focus on the strength mm. there are programs that focus on the the defects which is like that is not the part of your brain you want to be in you you will fix those defects naturally by building your strengths you don't need to build a whole part of your brain that is constantly thinking about defects no so that's that's that one go ahead and the environments have to be stress-free. Uh, so we don't talk about stressful topics. Uh, we do. We have plenty of other stuff to talk about. And uh, you cannot be with somebody who ever judges you. This is a horrible disease. It's very hard to work out of. It takes years. It takes tremendous skill building. And somebody who thinks that you ought to be further along than where you are, that person is hurting you. They're mm -hmm. abusing you. So it's got to be stress-free, your environment. If you go to your meetings and you feel stressed when you come out, that, that meeting is hurting you. All right, next. Oh, yes, and goal setting. Goal setting is automatically stressing. It's stressful. Mm. As soon as somebody sets a goal, they start panicking about whether they're going to meet it or whether they're going to fail. So we don't do any goal setting. We don't have any schedules. We don't have any agendas. We do a lot of education, but we also give people a lot of opportunity to vision. Mm. And that is a completely different mm. uh, idea. We do a lot of exercises to retrain the brain to think positively. And often at the end of that, uh, the various exercises, there will be uh, a question of, this is the person I want to be, or this is the person I became. And your brain will accept that. Oh, that's what kind of person we are? Okay, well, we'll start acting that way. That's easy, it's beautiful, it's fun, it's, it's strengthening, it's uplifting. That's not goal setting, but visioning. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right, what's next? Cognitive restoration. So remember we were talking about how the, addiction, the addicted brain cells pull the blood supply away from the frontal lobe. Uh, that means those those brain cells have to deliberately be stimulated to start working uh, really strongly, not just start working again, but work strongly enough to counteract the addicted brain cells. So uh, where we're encouraging attention, learning, decision making, memory, and impulse control, and there are very specific things that your program should be doing mm -hmm. to help you with that. I think that's it. Is that it? Yeah, there's your. Uh, yeah. There's my closing slide. The final there. So. Yeah. Oh, that was wonderful. It makes me yeah. so excited. Like uh, it just, you know, the first time I met you a couple of years ago, I think in um, Florida is where we met. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, it was, you know, a lot of uh, the, the work that I'm doing is all just piece together myself kind of like you it was like I know there's a problem I've studied as much as I possibly can and pulled the best of everything I've ever studied about you know the way the brain works for cravings and appetite and behavior yeah. change and yeah. match it all together in a program and so 
meeting you and hearing you speak. And every time I hear you present information, I'm like, oh, that's why what I'm doing is working or that's why we find that people get better results with that. So it's just, it's so validating, but it's also so exciting to know that there are other people out there helping um, with this really serious problem. And yeah. you know, we still have most of the population that denies that this is even, even, exists. even an issue. So yeah. um, thank you so much for- Yeah, for this is, the Carol, I have to tell you that, I, you know, I talk to a lot of people. I talk to a lot of practitioners. You are one of the few practitioners who listens and implements. So I really appreciate you. Yeah, <laughs> thank so you exactly. a lot. Yeah. Well, and, and um, so those of you watching, we've got a few people watching. If you've got questions for Joan, go ahead and type them in now. Um, I've got an eye on my email and I've got the comment section here. So go ahead and type those in now. Uh, we'll get some questions. I would love, while we're waiting for some questions to possibly pop in here, can you talk a little bit more about the mirror neurons? Because that was something that was a really big light bulb moment for me because I found that, you know, as part of my program, I've got, you know, course material they go through, but then we've got these live in-person yeah. Zoom meetings. Yeah. And I'd always found that people that came to those meetings, they had the best results. And I yes. thought it was because they just had a lot of buy-in, they were engaged in the process. But once I heard you talk about mirror neurons, I was like, ah, no, actually it's essential that they come on and see other people. That yes. what, the, the phrase that was new for me today was the, um, uh, conformance drive engagement. That was yes. that's a new phrase yes. too as well. So that's that's along yes. those lines. So can you talk a little bit about you know what are mirror neurons? Why it's important that we see other people that have the habits we want? Uh huh. It is. Um, I'm just going to tell this story again because I think if you get this story, you will get control of your food. Uh, so humans, you know, kind of appeared on the earth the earliest humans, I think, seven million years ago. And those humans survived to procreate and pass on their genes by getting into small groups, seven to 12 people. The anthropologists think it was seven to 12 people. Then twice a year, those small groups would gather as a nation, because they can see there are places where there were more than seven to 12 people. Um, so, why did those people live? Why did they grow up enough to actually procreate, create children who created children? It's because they conformed. Because their instincts, their conformance drive and those very early primitive brains were strong enough to say, just to watch the other people in that small group and do what they were doing. If they were going to look for food, you didn't hesitate. You got up, you went and looked for food with them. If they were looking for shelter, you you just, you absolutely followed along. You looked for trees or caves or burrows and um, you were totally dedicated to looking for shelter. If you, uh, if there were children in the tribe, everybody protected those children, you protected those children too. If there was a predator in the neighborhood, uh, you band together, everybody fought off the predator. Those people lived. So the people who did not have that conformance drive to really stick with that group, those people who wandered off, uh, well, there were plenty of wild animals who ate humans. It's just another animal and you would die. You would die. I mean, they, they actually, at the Museum of American History in New York, there's a, one of their displays is of a human standing under a tree. And on this edge of the, the display is a giant hyena coming. And the description is, we know that giant hyenas hate humans because we've been in the caves of these prehistoric animals and there are human bones in their bone piles. So this is the A, number one driving force in a human brain today hmm. because this is the single survival instinct that let people survive hmm. if you just did what your tribe was doing there was somebody in that tribe who knew where the food was you followed that person there was somebody in the tribe who remembered from the last time a year ago that they were here that there's a cave over there 
you would follow that person. You wouldn't go off on your own ever. Mm. And that conformist drive is still very much alive and well and functioning today. And it's how the food industry got us addicted in the first place. Mm -hmm. You would drive past the fast food place and there would be a line of car and your, and your car would just naturally follow those cars. Or you would see people eating this on television and you would be driven to eat it too. Also eating disorders. Mm. You see people on television who are too thin, which all TV producers, all media producers require thin uh, actors and actresses. Then you would either think, oh, there's a famine coming. I better go look for food. Or mm. you would think, oh, all of those people are doing extremely stupid things with your food. So we better do extremely stupid things mm -hmm. with our food. It's either your conformist tribe or a fear of famine. It's, it's people think, oh, if I just don't watch the commercials on TV, I'll be okay. No, all the people that you're watching are eating disordered mm. and we see their stories. So you just want to stop watching TV and start listening to Carol's meeting tapes. Uh, it's oh. a huge shift. It, ha it, it happens for men too, right? I mean, I'm primarily working with women and mostly women are going to be watching this, but I re that reminds me of um, back in grad school, I did a, a group project presentation about how the media has influenced men's body perception as uh -huh. well. Because mm -hmm. back in the 50s and 60s, the men on in the movies or on TV, they didn't have six packs. Like a six pack ab in abs in men is actually not a natural state. No. But every man now that has this ideal that like, well, I'm never going to be good enough until I can have six pack abs. So it's, it's um, just so destructive. Yeah. And, and so even destructive. in women, like that's a completely unnatural state for most women. I mean, there are some body types that maybe that is normal for them, but Pretty for rare. all the rest of these us women, it's not a natural state to have your abs showing. <laughs> no, no. And it's, it's, uh, it's not, the body is not comfortable being thin. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So um, it's, it's actually very, very anxiety inducing to be thin um, because um, for those 7 million years, famine was the leading cause of death. Mm. Yeah. Famine was the leading cause of death. And so your food seeking, food seeking function in your tribe was crucial for survival. Yeah, we are all, I mean, I know this is science and some people just don't believe in science. They have alternative understandings of how and why we got here. But according to science, every one of our predecessors was really good at finding food, especially at times of famine. Uh, so they have really strong food seeking brains mm. and they have really strong conformance drives. All right, so uh, Rita had to go for another meeting. She's not here. I don't see any other questions popping up here. So let's, we'll go ahead and wrap this up. I thank you so much for uh, all your time and sharing all this thank information. You. It's so important. Do you have any last uh, words or anything else you was, would hope I was asking about or hope yeah, just, you were hoping just my, about? <laughs> my closing thought is self kindness is the pathway to control over food. Hmm. The kindness of your group will, will determine everything. Ah, oh, that's wonderful. Love it. All thank right. you, Glenn. Dr. Joan Iflin, thank you for being here. And thank Thanks you for, the for having me, Carol. Here. I'm so glad yeah. I got to see you. Yeah. Thanks Take everyone care. for watching. We'll see you all next Yay. time. Bye-bye.